Hi, Steve. Hey, Tommy. How are you? Everything's great. So, let's see here. So, how old were you when you started to play? When I started, I took lessons when I was, uh, I started taking some basic lessons when I was about four years old. But I never, uh, I never studied real hard. I mean, I'm studying, you know, I'm probably studying now as hard as I ever did. You know? Yeah. I probably practice more now than I did when I was younger, you know? Well, you have, maybe you have more time now when you're not in the band and everything. Well, not really. I mean, I'm still busy doing a lot of different things. I just make more time for it, you know? What What was the first album you ever played on? <sighs> wow, the first album I ever played on. Gee, <laughs> that's a hard one. Uh, hmm, first album I ever played on. I don't even remember. You know, I did, I did a lot of sessions... Uh, um, I did a lot of sessions very early on with uh, David Foster, you know? Yeah. I worked on some of his first projects. Now, I'm sure I did some sessions before, you know, I know I did a couple sessions before that. But I did a lot of stuff with David Foster, the early, uh, some of the Hall and Oates things he did, an Alice Cooper album, a bunch of different stuff that he, that he worked on. He used to hire me for everything he did, you know? I was kind of his his programmer, you know, and he'd let me play, you know, yeah. that was those couple Chicago albums, but that wasn't, that was later on, but um, we did a lot of stuff. Yeah, so that basically around 78, 7, 78, around that era. Well, actually, actually a little bit earlier than that, I know I was doing some sessions in, in, in 76 and stuff, I'd done some sessions and stuff, I can't remember what the hell they were though. Yeah, well, it's a while back. Uh, so, so do you know how many albums you've played on or worked on? No, I don't. I know, because I know, well, I, I asked the same question to Mike, and he was like, oh, God, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, you know. Yeah, yeah. And It's uh, actually these Japanese, uh, the people from Toto's Japanese fan club did a discography on each member of Toto, you know what I mean? Yeah. And um, it was, it was, it was, uh, It was quite a trip to, to look back and see all the stuff we'd worked on. I mean, all the things I'd completely forgotten about, you know, there was a lot. Well, I can imagine, especially when you see it on paper, everything. Oh, yeah, yeah. There were periods of time where, I mean, that's all I was, you know, there were time periods where all I was doing was just session after session, and, and uh, you know, it all kind of becomes a blur, you know? You, you kind of forget all the different things you played on, you know what I mean? Do you ever, I mean, do you want to collect stuff you've done, or, or don't you care about it? It's like work, and it's... Oh, no, I care about it. I, I like, I like. yeah, I try to, uh, I try to collect things I've worked on. You know, I care about it. I like to try to, you know, I like to collect things I work on, but, you know, not all of it, you know? <laughs> and, of course, there's some things that I, I would like to try to forget about. <laughs> <laughs> Well, of course, I know. So, what, what's your best memory of, of the sessions? Do you have any favorite session over the year? You know. Oh, sure. There's several favorite sessions. Um, like I said, some of the stuff I did with David Foster, some of the stuff we did with Quincy Jones a long time ago was very fun. You know, uh, things we were first doing with sequencers and stuff in the old days. Um, uh, the Dirty Laundry session I did with Don Henley, yeah. that's a very memorable session. And a very good song. Yeah, very, uh, very biting, you know, yeah. very biting commentary. Um, there's actually a lot, you know, a lot that really stick out. You know, a lot of the Michael Jackson stuff, a lot of the Michael Jackson sessions were really memorable. Yeah. Um, there, there, uh, there were a lot of sessions that were great that were people that, you know, that their albums never got released or, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. They, uh, you know, you do a lot of sessions, and you know, you, sometimes you hear some stuff, and you think, "God, this is going to be a, a huge hit," and it, it never even gets released. And other things you work on, and you say, "God, this this is horrible. This sucks," and it winds up being a number one record. <laughs> well, it's it's like Luke said, you it's you can never tell what's going to be a hit. Yeah, and I heard him say that he didn't want Africa on Toto Four at all. He hated yeah, me it. Me neither. Me neither. Oh yeah. That, that's strange. I mean, it's it's one of your biggest hits, and everyone everybody loves it. It's 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 funny. Is that funny? I mean, but at the time we were, we worked on it for so long. I think we were just all kind of tired of it. You know? Yeah. The way Total worked. I mean, you worked on an album for 
I mean a year, a year and a half, of course you get tired of the songs. So so do you have any memory of, of like the worst session you ever did or anything that you did that I mean you can laugh about it now but that was like really embarrassing at the time. Oh, there were many, you know, and I really don't even wanna I don't wanna mention any names, but uh there were some horrible sessions in there. I mean there were sessions I did sessions where, you know, especially when you're working as a, if you're doing them as a, as a, uh, just a synthesizer player, and they're they're telling you what kind of sounds they want. I mean, there were things where I would go up and I'd ask them afterwards. I'd ask them not to put my name on the record. You know, <laughs> okay. Don't give me credit. You know what I mean? Yeah. I didn't want people hearing this and looking at the name Steve Picaro. You know? Yeah, of course. Yeah. You're, you're bound to. Well, you just want, you know, as you know, especially when you reach a certain period. Of course, when you're first starting off, you want to be able to do, you want to get all the experience you can, and you want to do anything you can, you know. But after a while, you want your name to just to be associated with, you know, what you consider very high quality stuff, you know. I mean, you, you care about the work you're gonna get. Yeah. Yeah. So. I always do. I mean, I st I still do. Uh, what do you think about all these, you know, ch the things about that's happening to Michael Jackson right now? Do you believe any of it, or? Oh, I think it's ridiculous. Yeah. I think it's ridiculous. I think the the press is. Uh, I think the press, the the press, especially in the United States, the TV coverage and everything. I think it's disgusting. It just shows how you know the the lowest common denominator that the press, you know what I mean, serves. You know. Yeah. That the people they serve are just, you know what I mean? It's it's ridiculous. There have been no charges filed, you know, and they're but they have already uh, convicted him, and uh, you know what I mean, making everyone thinking he's guilty, and it's it's ridiculous. I don't believe them personally. I, I think it's a bunch of a bunch of bullshit, you know. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So, what's your? I asked Mike this too. What's what's your best memory of Jeff? Do you have any like, you know, very special memory? I know there's. A oh, I have a lot of great memories of Jeff. You know. Yeah. There, you know, Jeff was Jeff was very. Uh, Jeff could be very difficult to work with. You know. Oh yeah. You know, especially being oh yeah, especially being an older brother of mine and everything. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. <laughs> He could be very demanding, but at the same time, we had many, many magical moments. You know. You know, especially in the studio, and of course live too, but in the studio, there were times, you know, uh, working on Total Four, a lot of times working on Total Four, working on the album after Total Four, that were just, uh, there were magical moments, you know what I mean? Yeah. It was that type of thing where everyone just kind of looks at each other, and you know that you're working on something really special, you know? And it's, yeah, I asked the same question to Mike, and he said, you know, it's, To him, it was like almost impossible to answer. Uh, so, what, what's your best memory of Toto? I mean, of course, there's a million there too. But do you have any like special tour album? Anything? Oh, sure. Um, my best memories of Toto were probably um, were several of the uh, several of the tours. You know, yeah. the European tours and some Japanese tours that were just uh, you know uh, kind of. The ones before Total Four, Total during the Total Four period, and even after the Total Four period, a couple albums after Total Four, where the crowds were just uh, uh, the audiences were, were fantastic. Well, the last tour you did was in what was the '87? The last one I did. Yeah, no, '88 was the last you did with Total, right? I guess so. I don't. I forget. You know, because I remember I had you know I had left the band officially. You know, and then I still did a couple tours with them. How come you left the band? Well, I wanted to, you know, the band was going in a different direction than I wanted to go in, is what was happening, you know. I just, you know, I, I just felt things, uh, I wanted to go in a different direction than the band was going in, you know. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to spend more time writing. Because that's really what I love to do the most, is to write songs and stuff, you know. And my kind of songs were just, you know, they weren't really... You know, total kind of songs. I mean, I would have, you know, one song every other album or so, you know what I mean? I had my occasional song, but I wanted to, you know, I wanted to have more input on what I was doing, you know? Well, I, I understand that. I mean, the songs you did, I mean, they they stood out. You, you, It was, for me, as a big total fan, I could always tell which song you wrote. Thank you. 
I love the songs you've done from like Human Nature for Michael and Leah and these songs are very beautiful songs. Thanks. Tell me about your idols this, when you were growing up. Who were your influences? My idols? Yeah. Oh, uh, when I was, uh, well, of course, you know, my, the first, the, probably the first band was the Beatles that really, you know what I mean, that really knocked me out, that really made me want to, you know, made me want to be a musician and a songwriter, you know. But then and when I was in, like, junior high and high school, I was very much into progressive, you know, rock, like, like Emerson, Lake and Palmer, and Yes. Those were very big influences on me, you know. Pink Floyd, Gentle Giant, that kind of Heavy. British progressive music, you know. So, so tell me, tell me a little bit about the high school bands you had. I know you had bands with Luke, with Orlando, and these guys. Yeah, we had great bands. Yeah. We had a band. We had one of the bands was Carlos Vega on drums, Mike Landau and Steve Lukather on guitar, John Pierce on bass. We had great bands. I had a lot of great. And what they were, you know, what they started up being was an offshoot of of the band that David Page and my brother Jeff had when they were in high school. Right. You know, they had a band still life, and I kind of took it over when they graduated and I entered high school. You know, I did a lot of the same songs. You know what I mean? Yeah. I had at first I had a, a, a brass section. You know, I used to do all the brass parts, write out the brass parts for the brass section and stuff. And um, and really, what it was was, you know, I didn't do we didn't do songs that we like, you know, that people thought we had to do to be a dance band or you know what I'm saying. We did I, I did exactly the songs I wanted to do. You know, the songs that I liked a lot. So we did at that time. We did a lot of Edgar Winter songs. A lot of Steely Dan songs and a lot of songs from obscure artists that no one ever heard of, but they just were songs that I really liked a lot, you know. Do, do you have any tapes of that old stuff? Anything left from that time? You know what? I have a tape of. Uh, I got. I just got a. There are some tapes laying around somewhere that I have a tape of uh, uh, a very close friend of mine who used to play saxophone in my band was taking an engineering course in Hollywood, right? And. Uh, For his final, they let a band come in, and what it was was it was like my band with Lukather and Landau and Carlos and uh, and myself, and, and Michael McDonald is singing lead vocal on three songs. Wow, that's cool. It, it's a trip because this is something I totally had forgotten about. You know, he was uh, you know we I knew Michael. Jeff was you know Jeff and him were playing some. They were playing at some parties and doing some gigs together. This is before you know. This is before Steely Dan. This is before any of that stuff was happening. You know, long before the do you know he was working with the Doobie Brothers. He just was a guy around town, and, and uh, my brother Jeff knew, and he did me this favor. He came and we didn't have a lead singer at the time. He came and say, sang lead on these demos, and I just got a tape of it. They were all what they were was all these. Uh, they were all these old Edgar Winter songs. Wow, how's the sonic quality of it? Wow, that's cool. If you're ever here, I'll play for you. Oh, yeah. Well, next time I come, you know, I give you a call and I have to hear it. Definitely. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. What, what's your favorite Toto album? My favorite Toto album is Hydra. Wow, that's funny because Mike said that, that that's his least favorite. Well, that's funny. Wh which is your least favorite? My least favorite? Yeah. Is, uh, oh, probably, uh. I think the album is great. I think it's only the sound that bothers me a bit. Uh, yeah, it, it was a, a bad marriage, you know. The the marriage with Jeff Workman, it started off, you know, it started off being a good thing and it wound up just not, you know. Yeah. It wound up not turning out like we hoped it would. Hydra's my favorite album. The spirit of it, the spirit of Hydra, the, the, we were kind of, uh, you know, I was still doing, they were letting me, you know, I was getting away with doing some experiments. You know, the way the whole album starts off. Yeah. You know, that was all me. I wanted to do a lot of that kind of... That was the kind of stuff I was always fighting the group, you know what I mean? I was always fighting with them about, you know? I always wanted to do introductions like that. Things that were very dramatic, you know? And they all used to fight me about stuff like that. That's too bad, because, I mean, I like the mystique about it, and I think it, that album has some of my absolutely favorites, like Mama and those songs are really... Exactly. Very, very good yep. songs. Yeah. Yeah. So, do do you consider yourself more a programmer than a, than a, I mean a player? 
Do you, do you? No, no. I consider myself a player. Yeah. So I consider myself a player, but um, you know, my playing is my playing is limited. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, I love synthesizers too much. I love what you know all what synthesizers can do. I've always loved working with other keyboard players ever since I was in uh, elementary school. You know, I mean, my very first bands I ever had, even in elementary school, were with. I always had another keyboard player. I think you and you and Paige. I mean, I think it's hard to find two people that work so well together. Yeah, we really did work very well together. You know, we still do. You know, we still do in the studio and everything. What have you been doing after Toto? Just writing songs. That's it, basically. Mostly writing songs. I've been doing some sessions. I've been doing. I did some work, some production work, some writing with Lionel Richie. And some stuff that's going to be coming out on his new album coming out soon. And um, God, what else? A bunch of different stuff, really. You know, a bunch of different sessions here and there. Not as much as I used to do at all. You know, I really would. I really am much happier working on my songs. You know, writing. You know, I worked a lot on Michael Jackson's last album. And um, but since then, I mean, it's mostly been writing songs. You know, um, now I'm gonna. I'm thinking about putting a studio in my house. You know, which I've always worked over at David Page's house. You know, I've always worked together at his studio over there at the Manor, and uh, I'm going to put together my own thing. I think now, and I've been thinking about doing some film work. You know, Correct. yeah, eventually. You know, I don't know if I want to get into all that right now. You know, I still want to write songs. You know, yeah. and I still maybe want to be in a band. You know, you got to start an own band, or you got to try to jump into another band. No, I, I don't know. Um, you know, I'm, the thing is, I'm wide open to. Uh, you know, I'm wide open to. If something comes along that I really believe in, you know, you know it's very, you know, it's very hard these days to, uh, it's hard to get a record deal these days, and, and, uh, and um, I'd have to really believe in what I was doing, you know, you know what I mean, because then it takes a lot of commitment and everything, you know, but I would, I would love to find something like that, I would love to find something that I could really believe in and really sink my teeth into, and, uh, you know, I really miss touring, you know. Yeah. I miss touring Europe. I, you know, I love going to Sweden and stuff. And yeah. So, so what? What about the studio you're putting together home? What, what are you going to use in it? Well, I'll be, uh, you know, a 24 track studio. You know what I mean? But it'll be set up for film. I'll have a MicroLink synchronizer, and you know, and I use a, uh, you know, I, I use a Macintosh 2 computer. You know, I run, you know, I run Vision software, and uh, it'll mostly be a keyboard, you know, a keyboard synthesizer kind of production room. You know. So you're gonna go, you're gonna go with like a big 24 track, or you're gonna use ADATs or? No, I'll be using a 24 track as well as ADAT, also ADAT as well. Yeah. Or uh, you know, with film, sometimes you need a four track or eight track to mix down to, so I could put dialogue on separate tracks and the, you know what I mean? Yeah. Dialogue and sound effects and you know what I mean, the music all on different tracks, you know. So um, I'll be using an ADAT for that, but I'll still use a 24 track for you know most of my stuff. Maybe do a lot of sessions at at home. Maybe you did a, at the manor because you had. Oh, I already do that. People send me their tapes, and you know that's how I mostly work now. They just bring their tapes to me, which is a lot better than getting the company and moving all your stuff there. Exactly. With the stuff you and David had, I mean, it must have been a drag to get all that stuff. I mean, to pack it down. And... Yeah, but we used to do it. We used to do it all the time. Because I, I remember when you you guys did my album, I was looking around at all this stuff, and I was thinking. How do you do it every time it's time to go to to studio and do this work? And so, so what do you think about samplers? What do you use? Do you have any favorite or samplers? I use uh, Roland S770 and the Kai S1000. What do you think about the, the the very big machines like a Fairlight or? Well, Fairlight's kind of you know Fairlight and Synclavier. They're kind of out of business now. You know, very shaky to buy something like that. You know. No, I use I like I like these smaller ones a lot. You know, these smaller ones they they you know they hold plenty of time. And then I use you know I use Studio Vision. You know what I mean? So I have digits and I have sound tools and all that. So I can record I can record an hour in stereo. You know, CD quality into my Macintosh. Yeah, and it's easy to edit with a screen and everything. It's very easy to edit. You know, and all that. And I do some editing. You know. I use uh, Sound Designer to edit my my Akai samples with. You know what I mean? I'll edit it in the Macintosh and send it back over the Akai all through SCSI. You know. So going back to the early Toad albums, like the first and the second, what kind of synthesizer did you use on those? Well, we used a lot of uh, uh, Yamaha CS80. You know, Mini Moog, Jupiter 8. You know, 
JP8 from Roland, and of course our Polyfusion modular. Yeah, right. Yeah, I've seen those on old pictures, old total yeah. pictures. We did use that. That was starting with the Hydra album. We started using that. We use it, and we, you know, that's the thing about it. One, one thing I, I was very, you know, what I was kind of proud of was the fact that, I mean, all that big monster stuff, it wasn't there just for looks, you know what I mean? We really used it, you know what I'm saying? We used it in ways that, you know, we used it for stuff that you could only do with monster things, you know what I mean? You know, I used to pay a lot of attention to the solo sounds and, and, uh, it just it was used and on the road as well. You know what I mean? We toured with it. You know, I used every bit of it on the road. You know what I'm saying? Even as big as it was, I used you know the whole thing. Yeah. Well, well tell tell me about this. What do you call it? The Damius, the the Orpheus, the the big systems you had, especially on Total Four. Sure. Sure. These were basically multi voice systems. You know what I'm saying? I could, uh, um, you know, in those days, you know, with with a sequencer, it was it was. Uh, With a sequencer over the keyboard, you couldn't have individual voices, you know what I'm saying? Where I could, it was essentially, it was essentially like eight mini mogs, you know what I'm saying? I never did that much processing and all that kind of stuff, you know what I'm saying? It was like eight voices that I could combine. I could combine a couple of them to sound like one huge voice. I could combine, do a couple to sound like, you know, one great bass voice and, uh, and, uh, You know, I used it all, you know what I'm saying? And the names we gave it, that was just to identify him for the people who were moving him around, you know? I'd say, bring me this, this, and that. I would name him, you know? Yeah. Then me, Rudus, Damius, and Phoebus, you know? I remember the the cover story you did for uh, Keyboard Magazine. They had, they had some nice pictures of the whole system in there. I mean, I, I love those old keyboard sounds, the stuff you had from from the first Toad album till I think, the Toad of Four. After that, on... On isolation, it started to sound a little bit like the keyboard sounds you you can buy in a D50 or like the Roland synthesizers today. So I mean, yeah. yeah. So what do you, what do you think about the synthesizers today? Do you miss the old ones or or I mean? Of course I do. I mean the synthesizers today are great, but you know you hit it on the head. You know, people you know people fall into a trap of uh, just using presets. You know, yeah, and sounding like everyone else. I'm. I'm not. I mean, I mean, I, I'm a guitar player. I, I play keyboards for, I mean, for myself, and I'm not that good of a programmer. And these new synthesizers, I mean, you tend to use the presets because they're usually very hard to program, not like the old analog stuff and everything. Exactly. Can Can you give some short ad advices? I mean, like for me, I use I use the, the new stuff, you know. And it's uh, every time I can find an old synthesizer, if I can afford, I'll buy it. But well, the important thing is. The important thing is, it's not so much whether it's old or new. It's just to find an axe, find something, and know it. Learn it real well. Don't just pluck through the presets. Find out how to get in there and adjust things and, and adjust the envelopes and make the sounds your own. That's the thing is, by the time, no one has time to do that anymore. And they just keep buying new synthesizers and buying new synthesizers, you know? And they never really learn anything that they have. And in the old days, we learned it because it, it, it was like years before. You know, every time a synthesizer came out, it was a big deal. From the Oberheim 4 voice to the Prophet 5 to the CS80. I mean, they were to the Jupiter. They were like, you know, the most it was like a year in between each one of those. Now, every month, five new synthesizers come out. And a lot of them, a lot of them sound really, really good. But again, they sound really good, but, but they don't sound... Uh, uh, You've got to make them your own, you know? And I, I fall into these traps as well as anybody else does, you know? Because of, because of the demands that people, the, the demands people make on you and how much time, you know, also, I, I, I've, I've, um, I change how much time in my life I spend with synthesizers and how much time I spend making, you know, making music and songs, you know what I'm saying? So you've got to spend time, you know, you've got to master them and make them your own, you know what I mean? You know, you can start off with what the with the presets they have, but you should make them your own. Get into them, learn how to adjust envelopes and stuff like that, and and the filters in them and stuff, and and make the sounds your own. Yeah, it's you know, it's it's always a challenge, you know. Yeah, it's always a challenge, and it's a it's getting better. I mean, it's getting better and better, but uh, it's still it's always a challenge, you know. Yeah. So going back to your singing, I he I heard some funny story. Like on one of the early albums, that for every mistake you made, you had to take like 
one of you know the clothes off and everything, and you ended up <laughs> you ended up naked in the studio singing. Is that true? Yes, that was me. I've never been a good singer, you know. And we were trying to do anything to make me sing good. Yeah. Do you remember which song it was, or actually it was it more songs? Uh, it was. Uh, shoot. I think it was. Uh, it's a. It was either it's a feeling or it was taking it back maybe for the first album. I don't remember. I think it was it's a feeling. Which which is a great song too. Thanks. It's a weird song, but it's a good, I like it. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's a it's a different song, but it's a really nice song. That's what it definitely has an atmosphere, you know, of its own. Absolutely. So, t tell me a little bit about you and Paige, the way you used to work in Toto. We so we're just a very good team, you know what I mean? Yeah. We're a very good team where you know we really set uh, our egos aside, you know, and uh, it's just kind of like you know, we kind of know each other. We know what each other's strengths and weaknesses are, and and. Uh, David gives me, we give each other our space. You know, David does some very good synthesizer stuff on his own, and he sometimes lets me do some playing on my own, you know? And sometimes I'll, I'll see what direction he's trying to go in with his synthesizer sounds and whatever, and I'll kind of help him do what he's trying to do, you know? And the same with me, where I'll be, uh, I'll be playing something in a certain style, and I'll say, come on, help me do this. You know, you see what I'm trying to do here. Help me make this my own, you know what I mean? Yeah. What I'm trying to do, help me be me and then just execute this for me, you know what I'm saying? Where we'll help each other do our own things. And it's a very good, uh, you know, and then of course then there's times we both go in together and we both do our own things, you know what I mean? And uh, and um, it, it's worked out very well, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, he's he's an amazing piano player. Oh, he's a phenomenal. Yeah. I got some old bootleg stuff, bootleg tapes of early Toto tours. I think the one, the first tour you did in Sweden in '82, you did a great solo together with like piano and synthesizers, like a big piece together. That's the stuff I used to live for. That's why I wanted to be in a band was to do things like that. Yeah. As time got on, the band stopped wanting to be do solo spots like that. That's why I got more and more. That's why I finally left the group was because. There was they kept taking out things like that and, and um, that that stuff was what was what I how I got off you know that was how I got my rocks off in the band was things like that you know one of the, the unique things about Toto is all these like middle parts in the songs all the instrumental stuff here and there and and the sometimes weird but great breaks here and there and the live stuff that's what I thought. I talked to Mike about it because I'm I'm not too big, you know, not that big a fan of of the last album. I think there's some really good songs on it, but it's but it's it's too it's too plain, you know, it's too simple yeah. for for a Toad album in in my taste, you know. Tell me about it. Well, we'll see, huh? Yeah, absolutely. I always, you know, I always help in the studio. I'm always there for them whenever, you know, doing whatever I can do, you know. But I just can't get too much involved emotionally, you know what I'm saying? Because, uh, you know, you get your heart broken, you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm really curious about the stuff you've written. And yeah, I'd like to play it for you sometime, you know? You know, the way I look at it, too, you know, Toto, you know, we had a good run, you know what I mean? We made some good albums, and we did some good tours, and uh, and uh, we had a good run, and uh, I don't regret anything. I'm still friends with all the guys, you know, Luca and I still hang out all the time, you know? Um, but, uh, you know, it's kind of... Um, I don't know, unless something drastic happens and they all get a real big change of heart as far as their direction goes, you know, I think they should just let it let it be finished, you know? True. These albums aren't, aren't, you know, they're not, uh, they're not like they were, you know what I mean? There's not the spirit, you know? I know what you mean. Yeah, it's sad. I've, I've written down some names here, like, you know, people you worked with, programmed, or written for or played with so I'm just gonna give you names and just tell me what you think of when you hear the name first of all David Foster David Foster consummate professional um, you know great songwriter and uh, we really we also had a good run together you know what I mean yeah. we worked together very closely for a long time and uh, and he really got me he really helped me get my session career going you know what I mean I, I owe a lot to David Foster so what do you think about him today, the stuff he's doing today? I hate the stuff he's doing today. <laughs> well, you too. I mean, everyone says that. It's too bad. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's too bad. Yeah, Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson, well, what can you say, you know? He's a superstar who deserves what he's got, you know? He's just, he's just you know, I think he's great. I really think he's great. I've written, I've seen what he's like when he writes songs and stuff like that. He's just got such a natural musical talent and feel. And um, I think it's too bad what the press is doing, all this bullshit. It's just silly, you know? You know, they just catering to housewives and, and people who got nothing better to think about, you know? You know what I mean? It's, it's a shame when, on the, you know, people are people are starving in uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina and they're like, the first thing on the news is about Michael Jackson, what he, you know, what some lawyer says he did, you know? Yeah, it's very sad. Uh, let's see here. Sanctum was fired, the soundtrack. Well, again, that was, that was one of the, that was actually one of the last things I worked on with Foster. You know, there was different artists on it, you know what I mean? John Parr, John Anderson, you know. There were some different artists on it that we worked with and stuff. It was fun. I remember it was fun working on it. Yeah. And all the guys who were in the movie, you know, Rob Lowe and uh, a few of the other guys, stars of the movie, were um, they were hanging out on all the sessions and stuff, you know what I mean? They were, you know, it was like they were just into the whole project, you know? Uh, let's see. James Newton Howard, especially the, the James Newton Howard and Friends album you did. Yeah, well, James Newton Howard is a friend, is a close friend. I, I see a lot of James. I see James at least three or four times a week. You know, I, I, I've actually been kind of looking over his shoulder. He's been doing a lot of film scores. He's one of the most talented and deserving people I know. He's amazing, you know? From his early work with Elton John, his, you know, his, the, the very first string arrangement he ever did was Don't Go Breaking My Heart. And, uh, you know what I mean? The stuff he did on Elton's Blue Moves album and stuff. He just he deserves everything he's, that's happening for him right now. Uh, let's see, Bill Champlin. I love Bill Champlin. Bill Ch I heard, as a matter of fact, I just heard a uh, a Japanese album that he released that was unbelievable. That was fantastic. You know, of course, I worked on Bill's, you know, again with David Foster, I worked on Bill's album, Single. And I love that record. Very talented guy. Great singer. Great songwriter. Uh, let's see here. Oh, yeah, Boss Gags. You know, Boz again, he was very uh, helpful to me when we were first starting off. You know what I mean? Doing the tours with him and stuff, that was that was such a great thrill. That was the start of Toto, you know? Was that Silk Degrees band, you know what I mean? Exactly, yeah. Mike told me everything about that. It was great. Mike got the tour, did it. Mike toured with that thing too, you know, with Boz and everything. Uh, let's see, and the last one is Steely Dan. Steely Dan has been, uh, you know, a huge influence for years and years, and they... They even, even, uh, I mean, their older records continue to be a big influence on me, you know? I think their old albums are like the, the, the early Toad albums. They're like timeless and they, they're gonna go on and on forever. Yeah. I think so. I think so too. Yeah. Okay, well, see, uh, I think I only got one last question here and that is for, for, for your future. I mean, what's, what's your plans and uh, do you think you're gonna do a solo album? 